Today we'll be building a multi-digit number display that accepts an 8-bit binary input. Hi, welcome to the video. Right here in front of me I have what we'll be building today. On the right side it's the input panel. I have 8 switches representing the binary that will be sent to the circuit. So if I set here a value of 50 we can see that this place will display the correct value. Make sure you watch my previous video before you watch this one because I'll be assuming you know the things I showed in the previous one. If you look in the back we can see that this circuit the inputs will connect here to the circuit so if you want to use this in a different place without connecting to switches directly you just need to connect sockets to this part. So let's start where we left off in the previous video. Right here we have the input, the 8 bits, and on the top we have the three outputs that we need. One for the units digit, one for the tens, and one for the hundreds. Each one has four inputs, except the last one that has only two. That's because for the 8-bit input we don't need more than 2 bits. The next thing is the yellow boxes, which mean if input is bigger or equal than 5 at 3. So let's see how we can do this. Right here I have all the possible inputs and outputs for the yellow box. So if the yellow box receives as input 0, the output is 0, because 0 is not bigger than 5, so we don't add the, f the 3, we just output the same thing. And that happens for all the numbers until 4. But then with 5, we add the 3, so from the 5 below, we add 3 to the input. So 5 will be 8, 6, a 9, and so forth. So to implement this logic with a circuit, maybe it's a bit complicated to have an if and a plus 3. So the simplest way to build this as a circuit is to build just a decoder that transforms these values directly without doing the specific logic. So we just map a value 0 to 0, 1 to 1, and so forth, 5 to 8, 7 to 10, 9 to 12, without actually doing the logic behind it. Back in game, here in front of me, I have my implementation of the double-double algorithm inside of Logic World. We can see that I follow the same colors, I have the yellow for the same thing I had in the diagram and then we can see these wires that just go through the circuit. So these yellow boxes, there's one here, there's one here, they are just copies of each other and we just need to understand how one of these works and we are fine and then the next part in the circuit is just a pass through with some delays so that the circuit has the same timings in everywhere so that it doesn't flicker at the end. So I'll now explain you how to build one of these parts so that you can just repeat them in the same schema as the diagram and everything should work. Now I'll show you how you can build the yellow part. Here below I have four switches to simulate the input for the circuit and on the top I have some displays for the output, but these blue parts are just for testing. Also, I just change this to grey so it's easier to see. To build the decoder, I'll use end gates and change their input count to 4. This way, we only need one end gate to be able to determine what the input is. So let's say we are trying to determine the value of 5. We can connect directly the bit of value 4 and the bit of value 1 and the rest we pass it through an inverter because they need to be off. So now this end gate will only turn on when we pass it a 5. This will make making the decoder very simple. There's just one thing we need to fix here and that is the timings. Because the inverter adds one tick of delay, we also need to add one tick of delay for the ones that are connected without inverting. So we can remove these ones and add a buffer in before, because the buffer also adds one tick of delay. This way the circuit is predictable and there's no weird flashes because of wrong timings. 
Let's do the same thing for the value of 1. So we add another AND gate with the input count of 4. The first bit needs to be on. The second bit needs to be off, so needs to be in an inverter. The third bit also needs to be off, so we need an inverter again. And the fourth bit also needs to be off, so we need an inverter. Now, this end gate will turn on when the value passed is 1. As you can see, depending on the value we are trying to make the end gate for, we may or may not need the inverter. So the best thing to do is to have an inverter and a buffer for every input, just like these two already have. If you are finding this video useful, don't forget to leave it a like and subscribe for more content on Logic World. And this is how it looks with the buffers and inverters in place. Now if you remember the inputs and outputs table we made, we know that we have 10 possible inputs, so we need one AND gate for each one of the inputs. So right here we already have 3 AND gates, so we need 7 more. So we can add a mount and we'll stack them on top. So just like this, and now we can put hand gates on top, and now we have 6 hand gates, we can clone again, now we have 9, and if we add another layer and remove the ones on the ends, we now have the 10 hand gates we need. Now I have disconnected the first examples I had made because now we should follow some order. For example, this first end gate would be for the value of 0, this one for the value of 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth, and this one would be the 9. So just as a final example, I'll do a 9. So the 9 needs the, this bit to be on, so we connect the buffer instead of the inverter. This one needs to be off, so we connect the inverter. This one also needs to be off, so we connect the inverted. And this one needs to be on, so we connect the buffer. Now, this one will only be on, this end gate, when the value 9 is passed. Now, we just repeat this logic and we connect every end gate so that we can determine what input is being passed. And this is how it looks with everything connected. It's a bit messy, but if you go one by one, it's not that hard. You can see here that all the end gates are turned off except this one that represents the value of 0 because I have all the bits turned off. If I turn on a value of 1, we can see that this one turns on and let's try 2, this one and 3, this one. So it ca there can only be one end gate turned on at a time because each one of these represents one input. Now to map to the output is pretty simple, we just need to see for this input, what is the expected output? And for the input of 3, which is the one that's turned on right now, the expected value is 3. So we just connect them directly. For example, for a 5, which is this end gate, we need to connect to a 8, because with a 5, we add 3 to the input. So the expected output is an 8. So we just need to do this for every input, connect it to the correct output. After you connect all the outputs, this is how it should look like. Here there is one extra thing we can do, and that is remove this end gate, because it's not connected to any output, so it is not necessary. So our yellow box of the double-double algorithm is done, it should be all working now. So let's try it with a few numbers. So the 1 should output 1, so it's working just fine, a 2 also just return a 2, a 4 should also return a 4, now with a 5 it should return a 8, so it did. Let's try it with 6, should return a 9, it is working, and let's try it with a value of 9, should return a 12. Yeah, so it seems to be working just fine. Let me show you how this looks if we compact everything as I did in the original circuit. This is how it looks. So we still have the four inputs on this side 
Here we have the inverters and the buffers all side by side. I have the end gates here, the nine of them, because I excluded the one on top. Everything is the same, just a lot more compact. And on this side is just a mapping from the input to the correct output. So both this and that circuit do exactly the same thing. This one is just a lot more compact. So the other component we need to build the final double-double is just a line with two buffers. This is just to make sure that the timings are correct. So each buffer adds one tick. If we see here, this yellow part adds also two ticks. One from passing to the inverter or the buffer, it depends, and one from the end gate. So both of them have the same delay and at the end everything will be synced up. Now let's put it all together. Make sure you look at the diagram of the double-double algorithm so that you don't miss anything. So we need five of these in a diagonal and then we add two more, one here and one here. Now we just need to connect everything with this one. And this is how it looks after we put all the pieces together. Now let's grab some single digit displays. If you want to learn more about that you can check my previous video. So let's grab three of them. And now we need to connect the outputs from here to this side. This is how it should look after we connect the wires from the double-double to the displays. We can see that the wires need to cross over and that is because the output of the double-double, the units are on the right and the display is this one. So we have to cross the 4 bits from here to the display. And then we have the 10s that are these 4 bits need to go to the display on the middle and then the last 2 bits that are for the hundreds pass to these two inputs in the display. And we are pretty much done. Let me just show you here how I set up the inputs. I connected the switch to one of the inputs right here. Make sure you ignore the first one on the left because this one is actually not an input. And now we can set any value here that we want and the display should be showing the correct number. We are all done here. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments and also share the builds where you are using this. I'd love to see. See you in the next one.